Dear Father in heaven, we give you worship and praise. Worship because you have created the world and everything that is in it. Praise because you have brought us to this point in life. And we celebrate your goodness and your grace here with our family, with our friends. And Lord, we pray that your presence might be here with us because if it had not been for you, we wouldn't be here today. And we know that one day in your courts is better than a thousand days elsewhere. Oh, Father, we pray for our speaker, Paul Nyquist. We want to hear from you, Lord. We pray that you would use him to speak to us. And Lord, for our dear brother, Dr. P, who's with you now, we remember him and we pray that you would raise up those who would follow in his footsteps. Lord, and for those who are here today that may not know you, I pray that they might be welcome and your spirit might speak to them in a special way. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. It is my privilege to welcome you on this special occasion. We so appreciate the hospitality and the cooperation and the support of Pastor Jack Graham, Sarah Gurley, and the faithful staff here at Prestonwood Church for the privilege of holding our commencement here uh, again this year. There are few events that uh, match the sense of satisfaction and joy that flows through the hearts of our faculty as well as our students on a day like today. The mission of Dallas Theological Seminary as a professional graduate school is to glorify God by equipping godly servant leaders for the proclamation of his word in the building up of the body of Christ worldwide. This year marks the 90th year of existence for Dallas Theological Seminary. We extend our congratulations to the class of 2014 and today marks a significant milestone on both our journey as a school and theirs as new graduates. God has been gracious to us. God has been faithful to us. And God has made provision for us. For the faculty and staff, it's a day of mixed emotions. Uh, we're sad to say goodbye to those we've grown to know and love as they leave for their respective lives and ministries. But we also rejoice for the privilege that God has given to us to contribute to their growth of knowledge, ministry skills, and motivate towards godly character. We eagerly wait to see what God is going to do uh, through these graduates. For those of you who are friends and uh, uh, family of these graduates, uh, we would be remiss as a community if we didn't express to you the core of what we're all about at DTS is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. Uh, that God sent his only son to be the provision for our sins, uh, to be the means by which through faith in him we could have life eternal, the forgiveness of sins, uh, the hope of heaven, and the help of the spirit while we await. If you've not yet trusted in Jesus Christ, the greatest gift that you could give these graduates would be today to respond in faith to that great grace of God that he has extended to you by having his son be the provision for your need as well. Uh, if you did that today and you told them, that would be the best gift you could give them. If you've already done that, you can think about another gift. They would probably love that. <laughs> I would like to acknowledge several special groups of people who are here today. If you're either marriage partners or family members of those graduating, would you st please stand and be recognized and be thanked? <laughs> Several of our alumni are here celebrating class reunions. Let me just mention them, and if you're here uh, for this, they have had uh, activities around our commencement chapel yesterday and on our campus. Uh, but if they uh, stayed and uh, are here for commencement today, as I read your class, would you stand? Representatives of the class of 1994 celebrating 20 years of reunion. Uh, would you and your spouses, if you are married, please stand? Let's wait to clap till all of them are up. 
Representatives of the class of 1989 celebrating 25 years, would you or your spouses, uh, if you are married, please stand up. Representatives of uh, 1984 celebrating 30 years, would you please stand up. 1974 celebrating 40 years, would you please stand up. And representatives of the class of 1964 celebrating 50 years since they graduated, would you please stand up and let's recognize them at this point. Our entire board of incorporate members returns twice a year uh, to meet, to pray, to evaluate the health of the seminary, to seek the mind of the Lord for guidance and uh, direction for the future of Dallas Seminary. Our trustees also meet monthly to oversee the stewardship of the finances and facility uh, related issues of the school. All of them serve without remuneration because they love the Lord and the people who uh, study and work at Dallas Theological Seminary. I would like to ask them and their spouses if they are married to stand that we might honor these men and women for their selfless efforts and their sacrificial support. Members of the board. Another group of faithful men and women who work so often uh, at great sacrifice behind the scenes to make the work of quality theological education a reality at Dallas Seminary, both on our campus, on our uh, sites that are uh, by extension, our online, all of that support is incredibly helpful to us. And that's our seminary staff. If you serve on the staff, full-time or part-time, uh, if you and if you are married, your mates who are with you, would you please stand and let us recognize you. Thank you. Many of them are out and about. Some of them are still working at the school today. It's also appropriate to acknowledge the godly and gifted faculty that God has assembled here at DTS. If you serve full time as an adjunct in our extensions or in the position of emeriti, uh, along with Dr. Charles Swindoll, our chancellor, uh, would all of you, along with your spouses, if you are married, please stand. This is the team with whom I have the privilege of serving would you join me in thanking them sincerely for their work? We would also like to take this opportunity to thank one of our beloved colleagues and his wife. Dr. Andy Seidel is retiring after 17 faithful years at DTS after he served as a missionary, as a pastor, and recently as the executive director for the Center of Christian Leadership. He is also an adjunct professor in the Educational Ministries and Leadership Department, as well as in our DMIN Studies program. His wife, Dr. Gail Seidel, served as spiritual formation women's advisor and is an adjunct professor in the DMIN Studies program as well. And Andy will continue to teach in an adjunct capacity after he moves to Fredericksburg, uh, he'll teach in our Houston and our Washington, D.C. extension sites in the near future. Andy and Gail, would you please stand and let us thank you for your years of service at DTS. We won't let him go far. Would you please join us now together as we honor our God through the rest of this service. I'll be reading a selection of verses from 2 Chronicles chapters 14, 15, and 16. The words of the chronicler which are also the words of the Lord. Asa did what the Lord his God desired and approved. He removed the pagan altars and the high places, smashed the sacred pillars, 
and cut down the Asherah poles. He ordered Judah to seek the Lord God of their ancestors and to observe his laws and commands. Zerah the Cushite marched against them with an army of one million men and 300 chariots. Asa prayed to the Lord his God, O Lord, there is no one but you who can help the weak when they are vastly outnumbered. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rely on you and have marched on your behalf against this huge army. O Lord our God, don't let men prevail against you. The Lord struck down the Cushites before Asa and Judah. The Cushites fled, and Asa and his army chased them as far as Gerar. The Cushites were wiped out. They were shattered before the Lord and his army. The high places were not eliminated from Israel, yet Asa was wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord throughout his lifetime. He brought the holy items that his father and he had made into God's temple, including the silver, gold, and other articles. In the 36th year of Asa's reign, King Baasha of Israel attacked Judah and he established Ramah as a military outpost to prevent anyone from leaving or entering the land of King Asa of Judah. Asa took all the silver and gold that was left in the treasuries of the Lord's temple and of the royal palace and sent it to King Ben-Hadad of Syria, ruler in Damascus, along with this message. I want to make a treaty with you like the one our fathers made. See, I have sent you silver and gold. Break your treaty with King Baasha of Israel so he will retreat from my land. At that time, Hanani the prophet visited King Asa of Judah and said to him, Because you relied on the king of Syria and did not rely on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Did not the Cushites and Libyans have a huge army with chariots and a very large number of horsemen? But when you relied on the Lord, he handed them over to you. Certainly, the Lord watches the whole earth carefully and is ready to strengthen those who are devoted to him. You have acted foolishly in this matter from now on, you will have war. This morning, it's my honor to introduce to you our 2014 commencement speaker. Dr. Paul Nyquist has the privilege of serving as the president of Moody Bible Institute, which he has led faithfully since 2009. There are many things that you can read in your program and I could say about Dr. Nyquist, but I think he was best summarized in an interview in which he participated upon his arrival at Moody. They said, and I quote, he has a deep theologian's mind due to his THM and his PhD from Dallas Seminary. He has a pastor's heart due to his 18 years of pulpit ministry in two separate churches. And he has a missions passion due to eight years in leadership of Avant Ministries, a mission organization. Paul Nyquist is a man with a deep passion to see lives changed and societies transformed by the accurate and the relevant teaching of God's Word. Paul, thank you for taking time out of a busy commencement season at Moody as well to be our speaker. We're grateful for your presence. We're grateful that you represent us well in ministry. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Nyquist? Dr. Bailey, thank you, uh, Board of Trustees, highly esteemed faculty, honored graduates, and of course your family. I consider it an incredible privilege to be the commencement speaker at the school that molded me for ministry. I came here in 1976, just four years old in the Lord, 
armed with an architecture degree, a Bible, and a heart to learn. I left seven years later armed with two more degrees for a ministry journey that I never would have expected, including now the chance to serve at Moody. So I thank God for this school. That's why I sent two of my sons here after they graduated from Moody. <laughs> and uh, next year, Lord willing, I'll be there in the audience celebrating when my youngest son receives his THM. So, Dr. Bailey, you got to let him out of here. <laughs> Being a college president, I know the role of a commencement speaker. We have four different commencements every spring across the Moody systems. So I know that the role of a Moody, of a commencement speaker, is a lot like that of the father of a bride at a wedding. You know, nobody's paying any attention to you. <laughs> but they want you there just to kick things off. <laughs> or being a commencement speaker is being like the flight attendant who explains the safety procedures of the plane. <laughs> Nobody is listening. But it's part of the protocol. So I get it. I know the drill. But if I could possibly grab your attention for just a couple brief moments, I want to take us to the Word of God. Because graduates, the society, the culture you're entering into today can be, I think, summed up in one word, hostile. It's not the culture that I went into 30 years ago when I left the hallowed halls of DTS. When I entered ministry in the early 1980s, our culture still valued the Word of God and sought to incorporate its values in society. That's not true anymore. Christians who unapologetically proclaim the truth of God's Word are increasingly seen as narrow, bigoted, and even hateful. I mean, we're being lumped into the same category as Donald Sterling of the Los Angeles Clippers. People don't like what we have to say, and they say, if you persist, there may be harm. Our society still has a measure of religious freedom that exists today, but it is evaporating quickly. It's like what Paul explained in 2 Timothy 4, just before he died. He said, for the time will come when they will no longer endure sound doctrine, but they will accumulate for themselves teachers according to their own desires, and they turn their ears away from the truth. That time has come. John Dickerson, in his excellent book called The Great Evangelical Recession, makes these four observations about our culture today. First, the broader host culture of the United States is changing faster than most of us realize. Second, the direction of that change includes pro-homosexuality and anti-Christian reactionism. Third, the rate of the culture change in this direction will further accelerate as the oldest generations die off. And fourth, these changes will reach a point in which they directly affect church as we know it and lives as evangelical Christians. So welcome graduates to the new reality. You're gonna be God's servant in a society that is hostile. So the question is, how does God want you to launch forth in a ministry in a world like this? How does God want you to do life and ministry in a society that is increasingly antagonistic toward you? How does God want you, as a child of His and as a graduate of Dallas, to face those challenges? Well, to answer that, I'd like to take us back to one of those early kings of Judah, who faced a very similar challenge. And his name was King Asa. 
You know the story, so let me just remind you of the context here. Asa was the third king in the southern kingdom of Judah. First you had Rehoboam, then a brief reign of Abijah, and then finally Asa. He took the throne in 911 B.C., and he reigned for a little over 40 years. And nearly every Bible scholar will tell you that he began his reign well. I mean really well. You can say Asa brought his A-game to the throne. Because here are four things that Asa did in the early part of his reign that I think anyone could, would consider to be noteworthy achievements. First, he shut down idolatrous worship. That is, he tore down the high places and the Asherim. As you know, ancient Israel was drawn to idolatrous worship like metal shavings to a magnet. They played the harlot with these pagan religions. And one of the ways in which they did that was burning incense to these stone statues and wood statues. Well, when Asa became king, he said, not anymore. And he tore them down. The second noteworthy thing that Asa did is when he was surrounded by a massive enemy army, he displayed an overt trust in God. He turned to God. This happened in 897 B.C. The, the, the nation of Judah was prospering under Asa's reign. But then in the 15th year of his reign, King Zerah and the Ethiopians surrounded Judah with an army of a million men and 300 chariots. Think of that. A million men. How many did Asa have? 580,000. Only about half the size. So it looked like he was going to be utterly crushed. So what did he do? He prayed. He prayed one of the great prayers of the Bible, found in 2 Chronicles 14. He said, God, we have no one else beside you. You are our God. Help us. And God did. He enabled Asa to utterly defeat the Ethiopians and profoundly plunder them. The third thing that was so impressive about Asa's early reign was that he brought religious reform to the nation. That is, from border to border, he brought the nation back into conformity with the law of Moses. It says in 2 Chronicles chapter 15 that he restored the altar of the Lord, which apparently had fallen into disrepair. And then he sacrificed 7,000 sheep and 700 oxen upon it. And capitalizing on that new religious fervor of the nation, he then led them in the covenant where they, they pledged to support the Lord their God in all their heart and with all their soul. And then the fourth impressive thing that he did early in his reign was he deposed his grandmother, Ma'aka, from the throne. Now, this was not a righteous woman. This was an ungodly woman. She made these horrid-looking asherim to worship to. But she was his grandmother. This was blood relatives. And so it takes a lot of courage, a lot of brass, to depose a grandmother from the throne. I've got a good friend back east who is an entrepreneur, runs a number of businesses, and I heard that at one time one of his, I mean, uh, his father worked for him in one of his companies. That's a little bit unusual, so I said, you know, how did that work out? He said, not too good. My father wasn't doing his job, so I fired him. <laughs> My jaw dropped, and I said, you fired your own dad? He said, yep. And that's what Asa did here. His grandmother was not a righteous woman. So he said, enough's enough. I don't care if you're blood relation, you're out of here. Now, the end result of these four actions that he took... That is, tearing down the high places, showing an overt trust in God, bringing religious reform, removing his grandmother from the throne. The end result of those four actions is that those who were hungry for spiritual purity, those who were hungry for truth, started streaming into the nation. Specifically, they started coming down from the northern kingdom under wicked king Baasha. It started just as a trickle, but more and more, every day, 
packed up their suitcases and started heading south and soon became a steady stream of people because they were attracted to that spiritual revival that Asa was leading in the land of Judah. So graduates, if it were possible for us to turn our tent back in time some 3,000 years and plop ourselves down in the middle of Jerusalem, we probably would look around and say, oh, it doesn't get much better than this. Because the people were rejoicing. The land was flourishing. And God was being honored. It was all good. But if you're looking for a fairy tale ending to this story, you better stop reading at the end of chapter 15. But the story continues into chapter 16. And here we see that while Asa started well, he didn't finish well. His problems began when King Baasha put a blockade at the border between Judah and Israel. It says in verse 1, in the 36th year of Asa's reign, Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and fortified Ramah in order to prevent anyone from going out or coming in to Asa, king of Judah. See, Baasha recognized what was happening. He was losing some of his best and brightest to the southern kingdom. You want godly citizens in your country. They make the best citizens. They pay their taxes. They obey the laws. They live in peace. You want godly citizens in your country. But he recognized he was losing his best to the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, if you and I had been on the throne of Israel, we would have known what to do. That is, just do what Asa was doing. <laughs> Get right with God. And then no one would want to leave your country. But Baasha was not you or me. He was not a follower of Yahweh. So his solution to the problem was to build an ancient version of the Berlin Wall. That is, he fortified Ramah right at the border between Judah and Israel, and there he put his army to physically prevent people from going south into Judah. Now, when you have an enemy fortify a border, that's not a good thing. That's clearly an act of aggression. Now, it wouldn't have been as much of a threat as it was when Zerah surrounded the nation with a million men, but this was still an act of aggression. But unfortunately, Asa doesn't respond in the same way that he did before. Instead of putting his trust in Yahweh God, he bribes an enemy king to help him. It says in verse 2, Then Asa brought out silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the king's house and sent them to Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, who lived in Damascus, saying, Let there be a treaty between you and me as between my father and your father. Behold, I have sent you silver and gold. Go break the treaty with Baasha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. And Ben-Hadad agrees. It says in verse 4, So he listened to the king Asa, and he sent commanders of his armies against the cities of Israel. See, here was the plan. Baasha had accumulated all his resources on the southern border between Judah and Israel. So Asa then sends a king's ransom to Ben-Hadad to attack him from the north. Money talks, and the plan works. It says in verse 5, And it came about when Baasha heard of it that he ceased fortifying Ramah, and he stopped his work. So the plan worked. When Baasha realized he had greater problems up north than he did on the south, he withdrew from the south and went to deal with Ben-Hadad. And when Asa saw that, they scurried across the border and they tore down all the fortifications at Ramah and then used those to fortify two of his own cities. It says in verse 6, 
King Asa brought all of Judah, and they carried away the storms of Ramah and its timber, which Baasha had been building, and with them he fortified Geba and Mitzvah. Now, the text is not explicit here, but I suspect that Asa was feeling, feeling pretty good about himself right now. Because his shrewd little plan had not only allowed him to frustrate one of his long-standing revi- uh, revi- uh, his rivals, but also he was able to use those fortifications to fortify two of his own cities. So I imagine there were chest bumps and high fives all over the palace that night. Because Asa had won, right? But then there came a knock on the palace door. Expecting maybe another well-wisher bringing congratulations, Asa opened up the door with expectancy. But there standing outside was not a well-wisher with congratulations on his lips, but a prophet with a message from God. His name was Hanane. And here's what he had to say. Because you have not relied on the king of Aram, because you have relied on the king of Aram, have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the king, army of the king of Aram has escaped out of your hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubim an immense army with many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will have war. The prophet stops all the celebration in the palace with the words, you have acted foolishly. And he has two points to his message to the king. First, God would have given both Ben-Hadad and Baasha into your hand if you would just trust it in him. That would not have been a problem. He proved that with the Ethiopians. But you didn't do that. You didn't put your trust in God. You put it in an enemy king. Bad choice, Asa. And then secondly, he says, God could have done this because his eyes have legs. He says in verse 9, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. And when he says, the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, he uses language here that speaks of someone on a survey mission. So it pictures God constantly, continuously, unceasingly moving across the face of the earth. But unlike someone who can only be in one place at one time, God can be in every place at the same time. And as he's moving across the face of the earth, what is he looking for? It says he's looking for one whose heart is completely his. And those words speak there of wholeness, of completeness, of soundness. It speaks of one whose heart totally belongs to God. Every nook, every corner, every facet of it is aligned with the heart of God. And proof that that wasn't true of Asa was found in that big pile of cash that he had sent to Ben-Hadad. Now, why is God doing this? Why is he looking for one whose heart is fully his? Well, it says here, so that he might strongly support such a person. And I don't want you to miss the richness of that promise. Because that verb is used dozens and dozens of times throughout the Old Testament. But there's one use that is particularly instructive to us. It's found in 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 10, because here that same word is used in connection with David's mighty men. 
You remember those mighty men. They were the finest warriors of their day. One of them killed 300 with the tip of a spear. Another one broke through the enemy lines in order to deliver a cup of water from the well of Bethlehem to David. Still another one killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. You remember these mighty warriors. They were the best of their day. Fierce, strong, brave. And it says in 1 Chronicles 11.10, that these mighty men gave David strong support in his kingdom. Same word. And it implies that one of the reasons that David was able to do everything he was able to do in his kingdom was because of the strong support of these mighty men. Here's my point. That strong support that David received here, while impressive, was just human. Brave, yes. Fearless, yes. Strong, yes. But it was just from flesh and blood. Whereas the strong support talked about here in verse 9 is from God. It's divine. It's from the omnipotent one, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This one is constantly moving across the face of the earth. And he's looking for those that he can strongly support. And what is he looking for? What is he looking for? A heart that is completely His. So graduates, there is the answer to the question I asked at the beginning. You are entering into ministry, into a culture that is hostile. It's a society that increasingly is resistant to the Word of God, resists His workers, increasingly persecutes them, maybe one day prosecutes them, and perhaps even one day executes them. So how does God want you to launch out into ministry in a world like that? Answer, with a heart that is completely His. Not partially, not mostly, completely. And it needs to stay a heart that is completely His. Because as we've seen in this story, just because you begin well doesn't mean you end well. So graduates, Here's my charge to you. It's not profound. It's ridiculously simple. It's the best I can do. Check your heart. Check your heart. Check it today and then check it every day. For the eyes of the Lord are moving to and fro across the face of the earth, looking for those that He can strongly support. And graduates, I want them to be looking for you. May God bless you. Dallas Theological Seminary is honored to play a significant role in preparing men and women on the graduate level for effective Christian ministry in the United States and around the world. We desire to equip godly servant leaders. We believe this equipping process or preparation is both an educational and a spiritual endeavor that involves three key elements. A strong emphasis on Bible knowledge and theology, the cultivation of ministry and relational skills in a firm commitment to spiritual formation and leadership. This combination of the scriptures, growth in spiritual maturity, and skillful servant-hearted leadership in the church is what Dallas Seminary is all about and has been for 90 years. Our 14 academic programs, one on the certificate level, nine on the master's level, and three on the doctoral level, emphasize these distinctives. 
You will find the purpose for the certificate in each of these degrees stated in the commencement program. The program also contains the names of our 380 graduates this year. 300 are participating in the commencement today. The remaining 80 are graduating in absentia. As you follow the names in the program, only the graduates present and participating will be named during the ceremony. 85 of the graduates have taken a portion or all of their coursework from one of our seven extension centers located in Atlanta, Austin, Houston, Knoxville, San Antonio, Tampa, and Washington, D.C., or from our Doctor of Ministry extension in the Guatemala City, Guatemala. This year, our graduates come from 41 states or territories in 22 countries. The multicolored floral arrangement in front of the podium is made of several varieties of flowers in honor of the graduates from these countries. Some graduates received their degrees last summer or fall, and others will finish their work and receive their degrees at the end of the summer. A small number following a graduate's name indicates this. Asterisks following a graduate's name indicate academic honors. The legend at the bottom of pages 6 and 21 in your program explains these symbols. Student and faculty awards given in commencement chapel yesterday and earlier in the school year are listed on pages 22 and 23. In the procession of the faculty and the graduates, you saw a variety of colorful academic regalia. Each robe and hood is intended to signify the academic degree held by the wearer and the school that awarded that degree. At Dallas Seminary, hoods trimmed in white represent the Master of Arts degrees. Those trimmed in scarlet represent the discipline of theology, as seen in the hoods for the Master of Theology and Sacred Theology degrees, and also the Doctor of Theology and the Doctor of Ministry degrees. Those trimmed in dark blue represent the discipline of philosophy, as seen in the hood for the Doctor of Philosophy degree. The royal purple and gold inside the hoods are the colors of Dallas Theological Seminary. It is my privilege to present the class of 2014 for their respective certificates and degrees. Mr. Billy Todd, Registrar, will give the certificates and diplomas to President Mark Bailey as I read their names. Dr. Joseph Fanton, graduating class, class advisor, will assist me. Dr. Michael Lawson, Senior Professor of Educational Ministries and Leadership and Coordinator for the Doctor of Educational Ministries program, will hood the Doctor of Ministry graduates and Dr. Richard Taylor, Senior Professor of Old Testament Studies and Director of the PhD Studies, will hood the Doctor of Philosophy graduates. Indeed, this is a celebratory occasion for graduates and their families and friends, and we want you to certainly enjoy it. However, we have one simple request, and we appreciate in advance you honoring our request. Because some graduates may not have a large, rambunctious cheering section, and because we desire to maintain decorum and keep the celebration enjoyable for everyone, and because we are recording this and we do not want to mention any, miss any names, and we also desire to save about 15 minutes in the program, the administration and the faculty request that you withhold all recognition, in other words, all applause, shouts, cheers, and other means, until I announce the completion of each degree category, at which time I will give you the signal and you will have an opportunity to express that congratulation. If they wish to do so, the family and friends of a graduate are invited to stand quietly in recognition of the graduate as he or she receives his or her diploma and then be seated. We want this to be a special time of joy and celebration, but we also want to preserve the dignity of the occasion and the enjoyment for everyone. So wait until I give you the signal, and then we can all celebrate in great volume together. Now I will present the candidates for degree conferral. Will the candidates for graduation 
with the Certificate of Biblical and Theological Studies, and all the candidates with the Master of Arts degree or corresponding certificate, please stand. Mr. President, on behalf of the faculty, I am pleased to certify that these students, including those in absentia, have met the necessary prerequisites, have completed the required work at Dallas Theological Seminary, and are candidates for the Certificate of Biblical and Theological Studies or the Master of Arts degree or corresponding certificate. As president of Dallas Theological Seminary and with the authority vested in me by our Board of Regents, on behalf of the faculty and in accordance with the laws of the state of Texas, I hereby confer on these candidates the appropriate certificates and Master of Art degrees with all of the rights, honors, and privileges attached thereto. Receiving the Certificate of Biblical and Theological Studies, Deborah Ann Chisholm. Michelle Deanna Copeland. James David Harmoth. Brenda Janelle Lewis. Edward Leroy Query, Jr. Receiving the Certificate of Graduate Studies, Shu Hong Tan. Sandra J. Barr. Chad Edward Beckman. Elizabeth Ray Boone. Stephen John Curtis. Jeffrey Paul Edmonds. John Freeman Fant. Brandon Wayne Hebert. Bryce Cloyd Helton. Susan Kerr Howard. Raymond Wyming Lo. Israel A. Lugo. Kevin Michael Marek.
George Brian Panna. Joshua Tyrus Pritchard. Seth Edward Ross. Oki Sabeni. Cheryl Mangum Salter. Nathan Edward Schnettman. Julie K. Smistad. Will Ray Smith III. Melinda Bailey Van Horn. It is our pleasure and honor to recognize our first ever graduates for the Master of Arts degree in Christian Studies. This program is taught completely in Chinese, online, and live courses in Hong Kong. Receiving the Master of Arts degree in Christian Studies, Chang Ying. Jeff Bauza Cheng. Young Iguan. Receiving the Master of Arts degree in Christian Education degree, Kyle Martin Alonso. Sean Renee A.C. Baxter. Avis Felicia Blake Thomas. Rachel Lauren Broom. Lorianne Brown. Tina Lucille Brown. Ellie Grace DeSala. Michelle Poole Davis. Sheila Ieli Etanga. Harry R. Everett. Brandon Levin Fletcher. Bethany Christine Freire. Robert Scott Hoheimer. Anthony Craig Hunt. Ju Chong Yang. Arlene McGuire Johnson. Sarah J. Kill. Brian Kipchumba. Judy C. Lanier. Angel An Yi Lee.
Leonette Y. Lewis. Christina J. McCartney. Xing Hung. Christy Lee Miller. Kenneth Christian Myers. Grant Gustav Nauman. Mondrell Oz. Rebecca Shannon Porter. Raymond Newton Preston III. Garrett Michael Rayburn. Lenora Deanne Rainwater. Kevin Ruff. Jill Ann Skufka. Brian Dorthadel Armstrong Spence. Kimberly Luella Tan. Sharon Titus. Sharon Denise Hobbs Turner. John Peter Unangst. Angela Anderson Vaughn. Timothy John Wang. Jules Williams. Kate Elizabeth Wingard. Receiving the Master of Arts in Cross-Cultural Ministries degree, Jason Allen Benningfield. Jane Bryant Sharnock. Jeremy Scott Copeland. James Reed Gardner. Angela E. Hogan. Zach Maltener. Ashley D. Matthew. Warren Tyree Mobley. Heather Jean Newton. Sylvia Orvette Randolph. Janet Rose Roberts. David Ross Stackhouse.
Michael Dean Vincent. Robert Wayne Wilbanks. Magdalene Elizabeth Winter. Receiving the Master of Arts in Biblical Counseling degree, Laura Elizabeth Alfonso. Anne Henninghausen Alley. Rachel Ann Armstrong. Shuang Bao. Suresh Ilya Bolam. Kendra Grace Brunson. Jesse Cole Dawkins. Alicia Ann Farrell. Eric Ryan Flig. Paula Fusilier. Brittany Gilchrist. Lauren Lee Gilland. Anna Hoi Ying Ho. Joshua Ryan Hussey. Patricia Joy Hussey. Lisa Jacob. Amanda Nicole Jeter. Lorraine Joe Jordan. Eric Anthony Keck. Sarah Grace Lavon. Amanda Irene Lindquist. Daniel Marchenko. <coughs> Margaret Ann McCrumman. Laura Leona Meyer. Trevor James Moffat. Natalia Stephanie Morales Fredes. Elizabeth Carol Parker. James P. Perkins, Jr. Courtney Ann Porter. Noel Warren Rogers. Adela Ann Rushing.
Amy Panel Salinas. Samantha Rachel Sepaw. Jenna Marie Schmidt Wilson. Addie Pauline Shepherd. Mark S. Strauss. Michael David Walker. Chelsea Miller Watkins. Receiving the Master of Arts in Biblical Exegesis and Lingu ling Linguistics degree, Adam Jacob Conant. Jamie Aaron Wilkins. Receiving the Master of Arts in Media and Communication degree, William Allen Bryan. Jessica Lee Gardner. Sean Everett Hansen. Frederick D. Hobbs. Nathan Townsie. Receiving the Master of Arts in Christian Leadership degree, John David Adams. William Seth Flores. Destin Bryce Garner. Jennifer Elaine Greer. Sarah Jo Herbeck. Jordan Philip James. Joseph Aaron Lentz. Rick Eugene Meyer. Carla Denise Zazueta. Receiving concurrently the Master of Arts degree in Biblical Studies and the Master of Arts in Christian Education degree, Garland Thaddeus Dunlap. Owen L. Wildman III. Receiving concurrently the Master of Arts degree in Biblical Studies and the Master of Arts in Cross-Cultural Ministries degree, Allegra Grace Fisher. Receiving concurrently the Master of Arts degree in Biblical Studies and the Master of Arts in Christian Leadership degree, William Travis Stewart. Receiving concurrently the Master of Arts in Christian Education and the Master of Arts in Media and Communication degrees, Jennifer Sue Brooks. Ladies and gentlemen, 
it's time. Would you please stand and join me in congratulating these graduates. Okay, we're back to rule number one again. <laughs> Will the candidates for graduation with the Master of Theology degree or the Master of Sacred Theology degree please stand? Mr. President, on behalf of the faculty, I am pleased to certify that these students, including those in absentia, have met the necessary prerequisites, have completed the required work at Dallas Theological Seminary, and are candidates for the Master of Theology degree or the Master of Sacred Theology degree. As president of Dallas Theological Seminary, with the authority vested in me by the Board of Regents on behalf of the faculty, and in accordance with the laws of the state of Texas, I hereby confer on these candidates the appropriate Master of Theology and Master of Sacred Theology degrees with all of the rights and the honors and the privileges attached thereto. Congratulations. Receiving the Master of Theology degree, Anthony F. Alexander. Falk Alaka. Juan Alberto Ayala. Iko Bay. Garrick McLean Bailey. Nicholas R. Bank. Gregory Mac Barnhill. Marnie Lee Blackstone. Philip James Borat. John Patrick Bowen. Sarah Elizabeth Bowler. Josiah David Boyd.
Byron William Grant Bradshaw. Jonathan Mark Bransford. Terence Lamar Brooks. Derek Westland Brown. Preston Anthony Brown. Joseph Robert Bryant. Kevin Joshua Calmes. Ka Ki Kenneth Chung. Dong Chun Choi. Aubrey Lamont Collins. Craig Thomas Congdon. Joshua Wayne Connor. Rory Paul Crowley. Robert Michael DeAndre. Richard Allen Dean. Sean Peyton Doherty. <laughs> Justin Robert Evans. Helena Lopez Ford. Elza Nathaniel Fowler V. Sarah Hoffman Fowler. Johnny Wayne Fusilier, Jr. Kevin Matthew Gandhi. Kirby Troy Godwin. Michael David Golden. Justin Lemuel Green. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a special announcement to make before the reading of the next name. With the reading of this next name, Dallas Theological Seminary will pass 15,000 alumni. At the reading of the name, I would ask that you would join me in celebration. <laughs> Gavin R. Gromacki. Today was his lucky day. <laughs> Jonathan A. Hallett. Carl Houston Hanchen.
Jermaine Lancelot Harrison. Buddy James Head. Charles Cecil Helmer, Jr. Carlos Moya Hernandez. Brian Lamar Hershey. David Rex Hina. Jonathan Lee Hollingsworth. Alan James Ingram. Joseph H. Ingram. Kristen Joyce Jacobs. Christopher Harold Grove Johnson. Gary Donnell Johnson. Abilish John Joseph. Jean J. Joseph. Trevor Eugene Killip. Po Yoon Kim. Kitty Lam. Zachary Weston Lambert. Biangu Lee. Paul Sung Hung Lee. Jessica Nicole Tron Lee. Yang Il. Elliot Lee. Jacob Lee. Tan Nagai Leon. Alexander Riles Laverne. Timothy Rodney Matthews. Zachary Matthew McCallick. Graham Saunders McFarlane. Joel Ray Megley. Michael Jason Mateltal. Dale Andrew Miller. Michael David Mitchell.
Richard Bradley Morris. Tyler C. Nelson. Aaron James Nichols. Albert Henry O'Neill. Oluwole Toye Oluwo Dayemo. Christopher Michael Opilo. Jedediah Paul Ostich. Jonathan Paul Owens. Nathan Allen Peets. Benjamin Andrew Penfold. Terence James Pender. William Holland Poe. Mark Allen Pritchard. Timothy Michael Reimer. Aaron John Reiskatel. Jamie May Wrench. Bruce Wallace Riley II. Lisa Lynette Robinson. Henry Rouse. Mark Douglas Rummel. Brenton Edward Saba. Peter Timothy Sample. Brian Michael Schneider. Aaron Matthew Schubert. Ferrado L. Serrano. Xiangping Xiangguan. Bing Shen. Raymond Tillman Solberg, Jr. Nika Spaulding. Crystal St. Illus. Jessica Lauren Stevenson. Jason Andrew Strauss. Chance Wade Sumner.
Christopher Dale Talley. Samuel Go Tan. Carly Ann Taylor. Brian Charles Turner. Keon Maurice Upkins. Derek Varghese. Nathan Kile Wang. Philip Jonathan Webster II. Jonathan Edward White. Rosie Wu. Jacob John Wolbecker. Andrew Martin Yates. Paul Chichan Yu. Receiving the Master of Sacred Theology degree, Josiah Seth Bisbee. Audience, it's time. Please stand and join me in congratulating these graduates. And we're back to rule number one. <laughs> Will the candidates for graduation with the Doctor of Ministry degree please come forward and stand in front of the podium? Mr. President, on behalf of the faculty, I am pleased to certify that these students, including those in absentia, have presented their prerequisite college and seminary degrees, have satisfactorily completed the Doctor of Ministry program, and are thus candidates for the Doctor of Ministry degree. As president of Dallas Theological Seminary, and with the authority vested in me by the Board of Regents, on behalf of the faculty, and in accordance with the laws of the state of Texas, I hereby confer on these candidates the Doctor of Ministry degree or Educational Ministry degree with all of the rights, honors, and privileges attached thereto. Congratulations.
receiving the Doctor of Ministry degree, Dr. Brittany C. Burnett. Dr. Kristen L. Campbell. <laughs> Dr. Edward R. Choi. Dr. Gregory Allen Hatteberg. <laughs> Dr. David Hernan Hurtado. Dr. Kwong Ho Jung. Dr. Sunny Ko Cho Fong. Dr. Terry M. Turner. Dr. Limay Wan Wen. The following graduates are from the Spanish language D-Men program hosted by Sateca in Guatemala City, Guatemala. Dr. Juan Manuel Medina Bermejo. Dr. Oscar David Perez. Dr. Gustavo Daniel Victoria. Dr. Joquin Ruben Vienna. Will the Doctor of Ministry graduates please stand? Audience, remain seated so that we may recognize them.
Will the candidates for graduation with the Doctor of Philosophy degree please come forward and stand in front of the podium? Mr. President, on behalf of the faculty, I'm pleased to certify that these students, including those in absentia, have presented the prerequisite college and seminary degrees, have satisfactorily completed the Doctor of Philosophy program, and are thus candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy degree. As president of Dallas Theological Seminary, and with the authority invested me by the Board of Regents, on behalf of the faculty and in accordance with the laws of the state of Texas, I hereby confer on these candidates the Doctor of Philosophy degree with all of the rights, the honors, and the privileges attached thereto. Congratulations. Receiving the Doctor of Philosophy degree, Dr. Charles Howard Cummings. Dr. Christopher Allen Graham. Dr. Keith Andrew Cobelia. Dr. Alan Meshe Ngumi. Dr. Terry Darby Moore. Dr. Hosug Park. Dr. Kenneth Wayne Yates. Will all the PhD graduates please stand, audience remain seated so that we may see them and recognize them. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father of creation, you are Lord of all. We thank you for the, the gift of your Son, saving us, making us part of your family. We are just so thankful for all that you've done for us. We thank you for all those here today, especially those uh, with whom we celebrate this great accomplishment. 
Uh, we don't know what you have in store for any of us, let alone uh, our graduates here, but we want to dedicate them to you. We want uh, you to use them for your glory. And despite the uncertainty of what we will be doing in years to come, we know that our relationship with you is secure, that you are with us whether we are rejoicing and whether we are struggling, and ultimately it comes back to you, comes back to the cross, and we thank you. Give this all to you for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen.